Engaging celebrity interviews. Exciting updates from Christian filmmakers. Movie reviews so you can choose your movies wisely. And so much more here on Faith on Film with Isaac Hernandez and Holly McClure. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Faith on Film. I'm so glad you've tuned in today. Holly, how are you doing? Very different kind of show. I'm doing great, first of all. <laughs> Very different kind of show today, Isaac. We're going to be talking to mm -hmm. a musician who I've known for years, you've known, he's been in the music world for a long time, mm -hmm. and with quite a few famous people, and he's written a book about his life and his start from his mm -hmm. mother, Maria Scarf is the name of the book, but tell about his credits, tell him who this guy is. <laughs> uh, this might take a long time here, because listen to this, now he uh, has toured and recorded with Lenny Kravitz, Bobby Brown, Frankie Valli, and the Four Seasons, you have to be our age to know who that is, um, <laughs> the, new, the new edition, uh, Jody Wet Wet Watley, Philip Bailey of uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Sean Lennon, oh my gosh, Lisa Marie Presley, Lincoln Brewster, Phil Kagey, and many more. As a matter of fact, did you know that sometimes he was known as the Minister of the Groove? The Minister of the Groove. <laughs> and what's even cooler is his name is Zorro. I know. Zorro. And he's going to tell you how he got that name when we interview him. But yes. um, we have a trailer, don't we, to take a look at? Yes, we do. Let's take a look at the trailer for his book. When I was seven years old, my mother knelt down beside me, tied her orange silk scarf around my neck, and whispered, One day, my precious son, you will do something phantasmical with your life. With those words, my fate was sealed. Now, 50 years later, it's time I share my story. A story about the power of a mother's words to transform a child's future. I would go from surviving the rough streets of Compton to living among the elite in Beverly Hills. From dodging eviction notices to traveling around the globe with the world's wealthiest people. Though I would go on to become a world-renowned drummer, my story is really not about drumming. It's about dreaming and overcoming insurmountable obstacles to make those dreams come true. It's a love story between a mother and a son an immigrant woman who came from Mexico to the United States to make a better life for her children. A single mother who raised seven children alone in pursuit of the American dream. It's a story about a family's unbreakable bond and their struggle to survive fatherlessness, economic hardship, and racism. It's a story about a quirky, hilarious, and tenacious kid who refuses to give up on his dream. Part sinner, part saint, but all heart in his epic quest for significance. And it's a story about the power of friendship and how those who believe in us help to shape the course of our lives. Now more than ever, we need stories of hope and triumph, stories that bring out the best in humanity and remind us what matters most. Universal stories of love perseverance and the power of dreaming big. A story that kneels down beside you and whispers in your ear, one day, brave soul, you will do something fantastical with your life. Well, we want to welcome Zorro. It's so good to have you on the show, old friend. How are you? I am great. Great to see you, Holly. We've known each other a long time. This is a fun. A long connect. time. We have <laughs> known each other a long time. And it's funny because I was talking to Isaac. He's like, I can't remember where I first met him. Isaac, do you remember? We, you know, we were talking about that before we started the show, and uh, we came up with all sorts of possibilities, <laughs> but I don't remember <laughs> which one. That's what happens when you get this old. Well, no, you know what happens is when you have 25, 30 yes. years of being in the industry yes. and the business and you're at a lot of interviews in a lot of places, we all yeah. have had that experience. <laughs> yeah. So we, I just want to say I'm excited because you contacted me and said you have a no, new book, Maria's Scarf, so we're going to get into that in just a little bit, which is another part of your career. 
But yeah, I think yes. you had a question you wanted to well, ask him before we start. Yeah, because I'm just a very curious guy, and I know we've got a lot to talk about with your book and all that, but what I want to know is how did you come up with the name Zorro? How, how did you name yourself that? That's a very good question. Well, that actually goes all the way back to my, and I talk about this a little bit in the memoir, but it actually goes all the way back to my childhood. Uh, I grew up in Compton, California, and I grew up in a very uh, sort of underprivileged area. And we did a lot of shenanigans in my neighborhood. And one of them was, you know, we, I was only like seven or eight years old, but, you know, I wanted to go snitch some candy out of a store. I didn't have the money. So I wore a Zorro mask. <laughs> thinking they would thinking they wouldn't recognize me <laughs> you know even though i had a cowlick like oh, alfalfa wow. you know that was totally recognizable so i would and it was a halloween mask so it kind of started with that and then when uh when i was around 21 just before i got my big gig with the new edition uh my mother had got me this mexican gaucho bolero hat and i started wow. wearing it around LA for all my gigs and club gigs and stuff. And then she said, you should call yourself Zorro, but give yourself one R because you're like the real Zorro. The real Zorro always had a heart for the underdog. And so he 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 oh, fought wow. for the rights and the privileges of the underprivileged and the marginalized. And so I took her advice and then I just started calling myself Zorro. And that's I became Zorro after that. And then I uh, legally changed my name and I never looked back. But now in the memoir, I do tell you who I, what my birth name is and then how, and I tell you throughout the whole story, then eventually how I become Zorro. But yeah, that's what it was. It was my mother's okay. influence and she was from Mexico city. And so I'm half Mexican. And, uh, and I kind of thought, well, I like, I've always liked the Zorro character. It reminds me of when I was a kid with the Zorro mask. And, uh, and then it felt like half of my heritage. So I just said, yeah, let me roll with that. And so we could thank my mother for many things, but that's one of them. <laughs> oh, you know, wonderful. In your, in your book, Maria Stark, you know, you, you, I go back into, like you said, your memoir of how you got started. Um, but why was it called Maria Scarf? Well, first of all, my mother's name was Maria, and uh, there's a story I tell in the book, and you can see I'm still wearing a scarf now, and I still wear scarves because I love them, but I also wear them in honor of her. But uh, my mother was a very stylish woman, and so she always wore scarves, and uh, I tell this story in the book, but when I was uh, going in for my second grade uh, school pictures, I, I didn't want to look like all the other kids. In, in my mind, I was a budding rock star, even though I hadn't started playing the drums yet, but I was a peacock. I wanted to be different. So I was, I was like, I don't want to be playing like all the other kids and be regular. And then I said, I said, Mama, Mama, I said, I want to I want to wear a scarf like you. I want to look like you. You look like a movie star. And she goes, no, Neil, you can't wear a scarf, man. The kids will beat you up. You know, <laughs> you, you don't live in the United States. You know, you don't live in Mexico. You live in the United States. The kids will beat you up. They don't wear scarves here. And I was like, I was like, Mama, Mama, but like, but like Elvis Presley wears a scarf and Tom Jones wears a scarf. And then she goes, oh, you got me there, Mijo, you got me there. So, so anyway, so she kneels down and she takes her orange silk scarf and wraps it around my neck for my school picture. And then she whispers in my ear, one day, my brave son, my precious son, you will do something phantasmical with your life. So it was kind of like just a moment, like a prophetic moment of a mother decreeing and declaring over her child that you are unique, you are going to do something unique, you are going to be special, and you're going to do something amazing, even though I didn't know what it was, and she didn't know what it was. So that is, so So Maria's Scarf is the title of the book, because I was looking for something short, I was looking for something poetic, you know, something that just evokes beauty, and also mystery, like, who is Maria? What is the scarf? I want to know this story, well, you know, and the scarf is really her really passing one generational blessing to the next and passing sort of a prophetic decree that I would do something amazing with my life. So I, I, I can think of no better title than Maria's scarf. And then on the cover is a picture of my mother in her heyday looking beautiful Aww. because she was going to be a movie. She was on her way to being a movie star. That's what her thing was acting in Mexico. And then there's a picture of me that picture I just described at seven wearing the scarf next to her. So you see the mother and the son juxtaposed next to each other. And it's a beautiful cover. It's 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 intriguing. It's really the book is really for mothers, really. It's for it's for dreamers, for mothers. And I I, I feel like mothers are the unsung heroes of the world. They're the ones that do all the nurturing and the caring and the loving and the uh, encouraging in the world. And 
it's a story about my mother, but it's for all the mothers out there, really. And it's for anybody who likes to be, uh, it's, for, it's, for all, it's, it's an overcoming story. So it's for dreamers. It has the feel of a Rocky Rudy, the blind side meets Forrest Gump. But I thought Maria Scarf was a unique title. And uh, incidentally, the publisher, Blackstone, my publisher, they said we get, you know, we change about 90% of the titles that authors give us for their books. And they said, once in a blue moon, a title comes along that we all go, we fall in love with. And they said they, they loved the title Maria Scarf, which I thought was pretty cool because I wanted to say that, you know, but I didn't yeah. know if it would. Okay, I want to do a shout out to your mother because she was a single mom of seven kids. Yes. Where, where was your dad? And if it's too long a story, you don't have to go into it. But I'm just saying single mom of seven children. That's another accomplishment on her part to make you feel that individual and special when you have so many kids. And she was a. She was an incredible woman who just had a, a great spirit of uh, faith. She was a strong Christian and had an incredible faith and was an encourager and just optimistic. But yes, yeah, she raised seven children alone. And not only were we alone, fatherless, but we, we moved around a lot. By the time I was in fourth grade, we probably moved like 30, 40 times, you know. Wow. And there was there was times we moved in my radio red flyer wagon because we didn't have any money for a U-Haul or whatever. So we would move from one apartment to the next in the radio flyer with putting boxes and box springs. And, you know, and so this, the story is really this epic overcoming story of this kid with the dream and how his mother instills in him this dream and it, despite what it looks like. And my father uh, abandoned me when I was an infant. And ironically, this is just the, the pro providence of God. Ironically, the only thing he left me when he left us, because he basically deserted us, he left a set of bongos. And there's a picture of his bongos in my stroller when I'm about 18 months. And I had no idea that that was my prophetic destiny, like the, the bong, you know, and, and oh, wow. it's, it's just kind of, it's very poetic how God, uh, you know, brings justice to certain situations, right? Uh, but I, I admire her now more than I did even when I was younger, because as you get older, you realize I, I have two children and I'm married. I've been married to my wife, Renee, for 29 years. And I've, you know, had a successful career. And even with two children and, and an incredible mother and wife, it's hard. So I just go, how the heck did my mother not quit, give up, kill herself, you know, know. or whatever, you know, know, check out with seven. And I mean, we went from the streets of Compton, you know, the inner city ghettos. And then we moved to Grants Pass, Oregon, which is like, it's like going from the set of Sanford and Son to the Waltons. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like so we 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 experienced a lot of hardcore uh, hardship in our life, but at the same time, there was an incredible amount of joy because of the, of her spirit. You know, and that's the spirit that comes through in the book. That's the spirit that will inspire every mother not to give up. And it, it's for fathers too, because it's just about what you pour into your children. You know. Now I'm glad you brought up the bongos because so far we've been talking about you know you as an author and and, and this book that you've written. But you're a musician. I mean, the, the whole bongo thing, that, that is part of what launched your career as a musician. And I know that you've worked with some very well-known artists. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that was always, uh, uh, people always ask me, you know, how did you get started playing the drums? And I would just say, it was just God. I mean, God put the desire in me. So all I had to do was be around music. And it's like a magnet. You know, like when you uh, when you uh, it's like all, all you got to do is be around that particular type of alloy and you're drawn to it. So the, the gift of drumming and the gift of rhythm was something that was just inside of me that got birth in there. And the desire to play was all of my life. But I didn't really get to start until I was 16. I was discovered. I had an after school job at 16. I was a sophomore in high school and my after school job was the janitor at my own high school, which is obviously a humbling job that's not cool for a 16 year old kid because when the bell rings, everybody was seeing me vacuuming and, and cleaning oh. the toilets and you know making fun of me and, and all that. But at the end of that two hour job, my last 20 minutes was to clean the band room. I had never played the drums, I had never taken lessons, but I would sneak on the drums and I'd see the sticks and I'd get on there and I'd just jam. Never, no instruction, but I guess I had an ability to play from the beginning because one day the band director was in there and he discovered me and, and he caught me and I thought he was going to fire me because he said, wait right here, I'm going to go get somebody. He comes back with another guy, he goes, play again, kid. Then I played and they both looked at each other, he goes, kid. He goes, man, you got a rhythmic gift here. We need you in all the school bands. We need you in the marching band, the swing choir, the stage band. 
Now, mind you, I had been trying to get in the school band program from the fourth grade, but every year I was turned down. Oh, so wow. that is how I got discovered. Wow. I got discovered as the janitor at my high school. <laughs> I love that story. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> so then you just you just picked it up by ear then. You weren't really trained then, right? At that point, I was only playing by ear. But then shortly after that, I began to take lessons uh, from the best local guy in, in a town called Medford, a guy named Kent Clinkenbeard. So I took lessons, and he was a professional drummer, and he gave me lessons and also became like a mentor. Then, uh, you know, I graduated high school, and I went down to L.A. So, yeah, so as far as my music career, I've been super blessed. But the goal was always, as a kid, the dream, and that's why the book's called Maria Scarf, a memoir of a mother's love, a son's perseverance, and dreaming big, because I was always a dreamer, and I had always dreamed of doing these things. And I, I guess I just believed that they were possible. So in 1983, my first big break was playing with the lead singer from Earth, Wind & Fire, Philip Bailey, the beautiful falsetto guy who sings all the Earth, oh, and yeah. Earth, Wind & Fire was my favorite band of all time. So, And then from there, I went on to play with the New Edition in their heyday. From there, uh, Bobby Brown for many years in his heyday, and then Lenny Kravitz and Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, and Lisa Marie Presley, Sean Lennon, lots and lots and lots of people, and a lot of Christians wow. as well. Played for many years with Lincoln Brewster, and I've jammed with I've jammed with everybody from Stevie Wonder to Phil Kagey to a bunch of different people in between. But yeah, so that to me is the is is the beautiful part of the story is that all these things the family had to overcome, and the kid had to overcome. Eventually, he was able to live out his dream with it, with with his faith, the faith of his mother, his friends, and his family. And so that's why it has the feel of like a Rocky, a Blindside, a Rudy, you know, because it has that overcoming feeling in the story and, and in the in the in the book itself. But yeah, it's been a pure joy to be able to play music at that level and express it and give people. There's something great about being a drummer because you you are responsible for bringing a lot of joy to people through the beat. Because everybody's rhythmic, you know, the human race is rhythmic. We all respond to rhythm. Look, look at little kids when the music's on, they, they can't even speak, but they're moving, you know, they're moving to the beat. And so I look at it as, uh, you know, God lives outside of time, right? He lives in infinity. So I always thought of my gift as a drummer from God as like, you have you have infinity, right? And then, then you have time within time. You have thousands of years, and then uh, y then a year. Then you have you know, you've got decades, years, and then you centuries, and then you've got minutes, and then you've got seconds. And inside seconds, you have BPMs, beat per minute, which is what a drummer does, beats per minute. So I keep, so I'm a gatekeeper of finite time, huh. measurable time, huh. in a way that makes people spirits come alive and it is universal i've been to the jungles of ghana africa where they don't speak the language and i don't speak the language but the drums made them jump alive so everywhere i've gone i speak the universal human language which is rhythm and so that's kind of a cool thing it's a god thing you know obviously he put that in me but it's a great joy to go around the world and knowing with two little pieces of wood i can hit something and make people feel happy wow okay i have to ask I know there's so many, but one or two favorite memories of a performing with an artist and then of you maybe doing a solo thing. I mean, because I know you've done that as well. But what are like a highlighter, you, like, you know, one or two of those that you're like, wow, I have to tell that story. Oh, well, definitely. I mean, there's so many, but uh, I always loved playing with my buddy Lenny Kravitz. I mean, because we're, we're kindred spirits. We both are, are faith guys. We both love the Lord. And we both have a very, very deep connection when we play. So anytime I played with him was incredible. I did have a very fun, unique experience. And I talk about it in the epilogue of the book where uh, Jimmy, um, you know, at the Tonight Show and Jimmy Fallon asked me to sit in with the Roots. And it just happened to be on my birthday. And then after I do a solo there, uh, and I literally end the book with this, but it's beautiful. You have to read the story of how it all transpired because I won't go into all of it. But anyway, so it ends with me doing this drum solo and, and Jimmy's got an ear to ear smile. And afterwards, he leads the whole audience into singing happy birthday to Aww. me. It's so like how many people get a Jimmy Fallon to sing happy birthday to you? Oh. And, you know, and he said he was a big fan of mine because he, he followed all those groups I played with. Jimmy loves music. Yes. So, I mean, that's, yes. that's kind of a highlight. 
Another highlight is how just music has opened different doors for me. And you know that scripture says, you know, your gift will make room for you. And and, and the other scripture my mother used to give me, you know, diligent hands will uh, uh, not per- perform before obscure men. They will perform before kings. And so I remember once I got summoned on uh, the yacht of Paul Allen. So Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft. He was Bill Gates' partner. At the time, he was the fourth richest man on planet Earth. But he loved music and he had heard about me and wanted me to come on his yacht and travel with him and record because he had a state-of-the-art recording studio on his yacht, which was called the Octopus, $240 million yacht, most expensive <laughs> yacht in the world. And and I got to travel with him and record and play. And so it made me think of just like oh how, God. how God can do anything. So I, I once was the kid who dug clothes out of the drop-off box from Goodwill and Salvation Army. I mean, my brothers would hoist me in there, and that's where I'd find clothes, right? So I'm going, while I'm on his yacht, wow. I was kind of like, God, you are God. You took me from the lowest of the low, and you put me among the kings of the earth. Yeah. You know, that is a king yeah. of the earth. You know what I mean? When you're the fourth richest guy in the world, yeah. that is the king of the earth. So just so many miraculous things happened, but they didn't happen to some kid who came from a well-to-do family whose father was a political person. You know, it came from a kid with nothing, with a mother who was just struggling to survive. So that's why when people ask me, you know, what what four words would you use to describe the book? Could you describe it in four words? I would say it is heartwarming, heartbreaking, absolutely hilarious, and yet hopeful. You you walk away with like, wow, like the, that those, those feel-good movies where you go, because we're all an underdog in some way. In one way or another, we all relate to the underdog story because most of us yeah. are underdogs. And, and and when we see ourselves in that film and that book, and then we go, yeah, I felt that way. Yeah, I was rejected that way. I had to do that. And so it gives people hope. And it's a story of faith. It's a story of what God is able to do, not based on you know how good you are. It's just based on your faith. My mother had incredible faith. And she instilled that in me. And I had this childlike faith, which I still do. I am still the same kid on the cover of the book. I'm just an older version, but I'm still believing for bigger things. This book is a dream come true. I, I've been, people ask me, how long have you been writing the book? Well, I've been working on it for 15 years, but in truth, I've been writing it for 50 because I'm 61 and I kept a diary starting at the age of 10. So I kept writing in my diary from 10 to 20s. There are many diary entries within the book that are absolutely hilarious. Some will make you cry, but I'm I'm 10 years old. I'm not writing them to make. I didn't, I'm not thinking that I have a memoir. I'm just writing my feelings. And wow. uh, anyway, so so it's really like the way I look at it is God's been writing my story, my whole life. But yeah. I have I have agreed with Him, meaning I believe you're going to do something amazing with my life that where I can impact people. And so the whole goal of the drumming, the speaking, the teaching, the writing is really to impact more people with the story that God gave me. That's really yeah. it. We've got about one minute left, but I want to, I want to, the scripture came to mind. I will set you before kings in high places. Yes. And I think that is a scripture for you. He has set you before. Real quickly, what are yeah. you doing now? Are you playing with a group? Do you have any concerts? Do you have things lined up before we? I, yeah, I am, I am playing with Lincoln Brewster right now and recording with him, doing some live gigs with him. And then, of course, freelancing with a variety of people. Anybody in the world can call me at any point, so I'm always freelancing. But my biggest thing is really this uh, this book, launching this book, and then also uh, I have plans to turn it into a, a movie and a, like a streaming series. You know, so that is th- that is the next thing. I have an agent in Hollywood who's working on about to pitch that to different people. That, the vision was always to be it for it to be a movie and to be a streaming series of some kind because it's very episodic in nature. It'll be like a, a modern day Wonder Years, but really about a kid with this drumming dream taking place in the '60s, '70s, and '80s rather than in the '50s. But that's oh that's that's, yeah. that's what I'm working on next. Okay, you have to come back and talk about it, and and bring yeah. Lenny Kravitz with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, actually, I was going to ask you. I don't have a, a yacht, but would you come and play on my pontoon? Okay. <laughs> In Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy. <laughs> oh, I think we might so sink good. it. <laughs> it's been so good to have you with us, Zorro. And God bless you on this book, Maria's Scarf, and all that he has still for you to do for the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And you have a heart and you're willing to do it. So you're a here I am kind of guy, right? Here I am, Lord. Yes. And he yep. takes you to do that. Oh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Isaac, so much. It's been an honor and a privilege to be with you guys. I'm very grateful. You're welcome. God bless. God bless. Hey, everybody. My name is Zorro, and I am the author of Maria's Scarf, 
a memoir of a mother's love, a son's perseverance, and dreaming big. And I am happy to be with you today on Faith on Film. I just love that. I, I what a great interview. Wasn't that a good interview? It, you, it don't, was. You like we, don't you feel like we could have got another half hour, Isaac? We could do a whole series with him. <laughs> I mean, really. He, <laughs> Lenny Kravitz? I didn't even know Lenny Kravitz had this Christian. I, so I totally want to get him on the show. That is amazing how he knows Lenny Kravitz and, mm-hmm. and closely. Not just like, oh, I know him, but he knows him. Right. I mean, and it just, it's, it's so interesting, too. We didn't even get to cover the fact that I remember when he played drums for Kim Clement. Now, for those who don't know who Kim yes. is, he was a prophet. He has passed away. An amazing prophet. Google Kim Clement, and you will see just how, in fact, today, his prophecies are still on, talking yeah. about what's going on with Trump. He prophesied Trump would be president. Mm-hmm. He's prophesied so many things. So for a while, Zorro played drums for him, too. Which you know, So he's been in ministry. He's been in the secular world. Uh, his art is a musician. Yeah. And remember uh, in the interview, I said that I couldn't remember really where I had met him. I have a feeling it may have been in one of these, uh, uh, you know, where he was playing drum for Kim Clement, because I directed a lot of the uh, the prophecy shows, if you will, of Kim Clement doing his music and prophesying. And I'm thinking maybe that might have been the place. You know, I love the fact that he said that he can take his drums anywhere. Mm-hmm. And even if they don't speak English, if they don't whatever, it connects with people. Right. It, it communicates with people. That shows you what worship music, what a beat can do. I thought that was yes. a really powerful statement. You know? Oh, yeah. And, and I really, as a worship leader, and I know I said former uh, or yeah, former worship leader. And former, I don't mean that I stopped doing worship. I worship all the time at home. I just don't do it now as, as my job. Uh, but as a worship leader, I really appreciated what he said about worship because I, I totally agree with it. I mean, just whenever, again, whenever I, I, I just need to calm down or something, worship is what really calms me down and connects me to God. Uh, and suddenly my troubles seem to fade away. Isn't that a song? <laughs> I think it is. And I hope that was an inspiring story it for was. single moms out there mm-hmm. and for people who have lots of kids and children. And you yeah. think, oh, what, what's going to happen to these kids? Well, look at that mother and her faith. And how she held up strong, all, and like you said, lived yeah. in poverty. I, I mean, for for many years, and how many times did they move, and yet came out of that. That is such an overcoming story that he came well, out of that situation of poverty and and not having a dad, and then was mentored yeah. by the guy in high school and different people. How and then became this famous, like you said, on a yacht, on a private <laughs> yacht. I mean, wow, what a journey in life to go through. I know, and what a great tribute to his mom, you know. Oh, yeah. And that's part that part Hispanic, you know, Mexican culture and um, bringing that in. I don't know. I just I really enjoyed it. And he said, you have to get the book to find out his real name. Do you know I've known Zorro for years and years? He's never told me his real name. I actually found out what it was. I found out what it was, but I'm not going to say it. (laughs) Okay, I want to ask you when we're off the air. I want to ask you because it's like, because I remember I used to ask my aunt, say, why do you wear that hat? He goes, oh, it's just part of me. Zorro, well, it's like Cher or whatever. You know what I mean? You have that name and then, you know. But I love the way he when right. he first got it. That was just so good. Um, all right. Well, that's it for today, Holly. Great show. Yep. We'll see you all next week. Appreciate all of you guys. God bless. Write to us at faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. That's faithonfilmtv at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at faithonfilmtv. Also, Go to our YouTube channel, Faith on Film TV, and hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications on our latest Faith on Film shows.